Hi everybody and welcome to this new session of the AWS Africa Virtual Day. My name is Julian and I'm a tech evangelist with AWS focusing on AI and machine learning. In this session I'm going to talk about a machine learning service called Amazon SageMaker and how it helps you build, train and deploy your machine learning models easily and quickly in production. First of all, we have to take a look at the usual machine learning workflow. And as you may know, it is pretty complex. It involves a lot of different steps from preparing your data set, collecting data, cleaning data, uh, etc., etc., building ingestion and ETL workflows so that you can transform raw data into data that can be used for machine learning. And then learning from the data and exploring it, you have to select a machine learning algorithm. So you're going to use your experience, you're going to use your intuition, of course, but you're going to experiment a lot. And you're going to try out a whole bunch of different algos that could solve your problem. So for example, if you're dealing with a classification problem, then you may want to try all kinds of different algorithms for classification, statistical machine learning, deep learning, etc. So you need a lot of, uh, of experimentation to find the algo that's, or the couple of algos that are most promising. Then you need to train and tune your models. So you're going to train on the full data set and uh, hopefully things will work out okay, but sometimes they don't. So you may need to debug your models, understand why you're not uh, converging to high accuracy. And even if you are, you want to tune them, you want to squeeze every drop of accuracy from the model. And over that process, you may very well train tens, hundreds of different models. So it's not easy to manage them. And you may waste a lot of time figuring out, hey, where's that, uh, uh, where's that job that I run three days ago? And uh, the one that I had this good uh, hyperparameter combination for, et cetera, et cetera. So you need a lot of infrastructure, you need a lot of tools, and, um, and all the time you spend building that is time that you're not spending on the machine learning problem itself. And by the time you get to a model that you like, a model that performs correctly, then you need to deploy it in production. And I would say that's where the real problems start because you need to monitor the model, uh, you need to make sure it's predicting okay, predicting fast enough, uh, if it's connected to uh, business applications or end user applications and it starts behaving in a weird way, you know, problems can uh, go uh, uh, bad really, really quickly. Uh, so you need to make sure it's all predicting fine and well, you just generally need to keep an eye on your production environment, scale it, manage it, etc., just like you would for, for a normal web application. So as you can see, there's a lot of stuff here. Some of it is data engineering. Some of it is proper data science and machine learning. Lots of it is really managing infrastructure, building and, 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 and running training clusters and prediction clusters and making sure everything works. And well, that's all right, but if you are trying to build a machine learning model, you really want to focus on the machine learning task itself. And I guess this is why we built Amazon SageMaker. Uh, we built SageMaker to help customers get from early experimentation to scalable production as quickly as possible with minimal fuss and with minimal uh, time spent on anything that's not machine learning and uh, and over time SageMaker has grown into um, a pretty large service with lots of new capabilities um, and in this session I'm going to try and give you an overview of all those capabilities I won't be able to cover all of them because there, <laughs> there are so many and more every week but just try to give you an overview and, and share some some pointers and resources on, on where to go next so um, at the very top of this slide, you see this uh, web-based IDE. And uh, well, this is a, a capability that was uh, released at, uh, at the latest reInvent. And uh, it's called SageMaker Studio. And it is a web-based IDE for machine learning. And that's the one I'm going to be using in the demo later on. 
Um, then we have basically features and APIs to let you go from collecting, preparing uh, data, choosing an algo, to training, tuning, deploying, etc. So all those steps that I um, talked about in the, in the previous slide, uh, we try to uh, uh, integrate them into SageMaker and, uh, and make it as easy as possible to, um, uh, to go from A to Z. And uh, really, you, you have to see SageMaker as a modular service and, and a modular set of APIs. So if you want to go from experimentation to uh, uh, production with SageMaker, that's great, but maybe that's not what you need. Maybe you need to find a scalable solution for training. And so you want to train on SageMaker and then you want to deploy somewhere else, right? Maybe you want to deploy the model to uh, um, IoT devices, why not? Okay, so deploying in the cloud is, is not what you're looking for. And that's, right, that's okay, that's fine. You can absolutely train on SageMaker, grab the model and deploy elsewhere. And likewise, you could uh, import an existing model to SageMaker, the model that you already trained, that you're happy with, and you want to deploy it at scale for your users in the cloud, right? So that's totally possible too. So uh, it's really a, a collection of capabilities. So just pick the ones that you need, <laughs> pick the ones that uh, are required for your business use case and ignore the rest, right? But if you're starting, starting from scratch or if you're looking for an end-to-end -end solution, uh, you can also do that on SageMaker. Um, so let's go through um, those different steps. And, uh, and obviously, we're going to go through data preparation first. And depending on your data set, preparing data can be, you know, a bit of work or a ton of work. And, uh, well, I would say if you're working with um, applications like computer vision or natural language processing, uh, data sets tend to be very large, very complex, and you would be on the uh, tons of work end of the spectrum. So here's an example for autonomous driving. So if you want to build a computer vision for autonomous driving, you need to go through tens of thousands, potentially hundreds of thousands, maybe more, uh, images like these and, and annotate them. So uh, on the right hand side, you see annotated images. And this is a process called semantic segmentation, where we assign every pixel in the image to a specific instance, a specific class. Okay, so the, the pink stuff is, is the road and, um, and the yellowish greenish stuff is vegetation, etc, etc. So you have to do this and, and you have to do this by hand. So uh, imagine how much time it would take you to do one of those. Now multiply the number by 10,000 or 100,000 and now you see the problem. And obviously Images are the most complex use case, but again, annotating data sets for natural language processing, for entity extraction, etc., sentiment analysis is a lot of work because you're likely to be dealing with, you know, hundreds of thousands of different samples. So it's not something you you want to do manually and, and and yourself if you can if you could avoid it. So uh, we build a capability called SageMaker Ground Truth which is uh, totally integrated into SageMaker and you can build workflows where starting from a data set in Amazon S3 or storage service, you distribute uh, samples to be annotated to a workforce, which could be a private workforce, people from your company, people you know. Uh, it could be a third party workforce. Uh, we have uh, vendors that have been uh, vetted by uh, uh, AWS and can help you uh, uh, with those uh, tasks and you can also use a, a public workforce um, and uh, and this is a service called mtark uh, on uh, on amazon where you can distribute um, a work to potentially hundreds of thousands of people for really large-scale annotation and you can also use um, a feature called automatic labeling where in parallel of human annotations uh, you train automatically a machine learning model that looks at human annotations and when the model is able to do 
as well as humans, when the, the confidence for these annotations is as good as human labelers, then the model starts labeling at scale. And, um, and of course, it's going to go much faster than humans. And, um, and so you're gonna be, it's going to be faster and cheaper. So the combination of uh, human labelers and machine learning labeling helps you label potentially millions of samples in rel relatively little time and at a much lower cost than uh, uh, computing uh, solutions. So this is a really interesting service. You can annotate images, you can annotate text, you can build custom workflows. And actually this week we also uh, released um, a capability to label 3D, 3D data, 3D point clouds uh, that are typically used for autonomous driving with uh, LiDAR data sets and, and generally you know, 3D data sets. So lots of possibilities here. Um, well, not everybody works with uh, crazy data sets, but like, uh, like the ones I mentioned, but I guess everyone has to do some sort of processing on data sets. So we, we added a capability called SageMaker Processing, which, which makes it very, very easy to run uh, batch jobs where uh, you can do things like feature engineering or, or uh, you know, data cleaning or model evaluation after training, etc. You know, cross validation, etc., etc. So you can bring your own code and you can run that code on your uh, data set, on your models uh, in a fully managed way on fully managed infrastructure. And, um, and well, all those jobs that are, you know, before or after model training, and you know we are, we all have those then you can run them easily on the, on SageMaker processing so just a very convenient way to do all those different tasks around training so now let's talk about building models so the first step is of course experimentation figuring out which algo is a good candidate um, for uh, the model you're trying to solve so a popular way to do this is to use uh, Jupyter Notebooks. And so SageMaker includes what we call Notebook instances, which are fully managed EC2 instances from the very small ones to the really, really multi GPU large ones. And they come pre-installed with hopefully all the tools that you need, you know, Python, open source libraries like TensorFlow, PyTorch, Scikit-Learn, MXNet, etc. Uh, we have the beta support for R as well, for R users. And, um, and you can experiment with those fully managed notebooks uh, using data stored uh, in S3. And of course, you can use any AWS SDK and generally any uh, Python or R library there. So just a simple way to uh, fire up uh, development and experiments uh, and, and um, uh, development and yeah, experimental environments uh, and, and try to get uh, early, uh, an early opinion and an early fit on the, on the data set. Um, because security is important, we have plenty of extra features. You can run those inside virtual private clouds. You can encrypt local storage. Uh, you can uh, deny internet access, etc., etc. So um, these are really, uh, you can really lock down the security configuration of those instances. And it really just takes a couple of minutes to, to create one, right? Um, the, the newer way, and the, probably the preferred way now to, uh, to, do the, to do the same, is to use SageMaker Studio. So that uh, machine learning environment that I mentioned. And again, uh, we're going to look at it in a, in a few minutes. So um, it's still based on Jupyter Notebooks but we don't have notebook instances anymore so you just uh, go through the quick start for studio and and you open your environment and you can select different sizes but you don't have to provision and and manage um, uh, instances like before okay it's uh, it's a much smoother experience in that respect um so it's not just that uh, it also adds um, a number of features like collaboration you can very easily share notebooks so uh, once uh, you know, you've uh, uh, put something together, you want to send a link to a colleague, then, you know, it's it's really a one-click operation to send them a link. And they can go and open that link and jump straight into Studio and see, see the notebook you're working on and give you some uh, 
some advice, some opinion on, on what you're doing and what they think, etc., etc. They can run the notebook themselves and so on. So that's very cool if you have a, a team of people collaborating here. Um, we also have features for uh, experiment management. This is integrated with uh, SageMaker experiments. I'm, I'm going to talk about that in a, in, a in a minute. So just a, um, a, a set of APIs that make it easy to manage the hundreds, thousands of different jobs that are running, whether it's you know processing data or or training models, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, we also have integration with another capability called SageMaker Autopilot, which is a, an AutoML capability where you can uh, you have a really a no code, a zero code experience to uh, build a model. Uh, we'll we'll take a look at that in a minute, and um, and generally you have. Um, you know, GUI integration with a lot of SageMaker capabilities for you know model monitoring, model deployment, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, um, you know, some people just love APIs and they're they want to write every line of code. Some people like to use uh, you know shortcuts and, and GUIs, etc. And well, SageMaker Studio lets you do that. Okay. So here's a, here's a screenshot from Studio. Um, it is based, like I said, on Jupyter, so you'll be very, very familiar with it. And you can see on the left-hand side, this um, icon toolbar is where we have integrations with uh, with all those uh, extra SageMaker capabilities, right? And, uh, and of course, you can import any library in there. It's a vanilla notebook. You can just work the way uh, you're working today, but, you know, just um, a friendlier and easier way to access all the SageMaker capabilities. So when it comes to training, building models, we have different options. So let's go from the easiest one to the more advanced one. So the easiest one is to actually not train anything, right? If you can avoid building and training a model, a model altogether, you know, you just go quicker, you save time and money, and go to production quicker. And this is what the AWS marketplace for machine learning is all about. Um, you may be familiar with the AWS Marketplace for EC2, where we have thousands and thousands of um, third-party software prepackaged, ready to be deployed on EC2 instances. Well, we've done the same for models. So we have hundreds of models for natural language processing and computer vision and literally all kinds of things, including some very, very advanced uh, models. And, uh, and you can just go and find a model that looks like the problem you're trying to solve uh, deploy it on SageMaker in just a few clicks. Give it a try, and um, and if you know if it solves the problem, then fine, right? Uh, you don't need to look any further. Um, maybe it's a good place to start, you know, your uh, POC, your proof of concept, and uh, and learn more about the problem, and then decide for yourself if you really need to build something or not. So I think the marketplace should really be your first stop when you uh, consider. Um, uh, building a model. Maybe you can find a quicker a quicker route here. Um, the second easiest option is the one on the right. So it's SageMaker Autopilot, a capa an AutoML capability where you simply bring your data to S3. Um, we support tabular data at this point for regression and classification problems. And um, and either you know you just click a couple of times in Studio, or you call a, a one API in uh, in your notebook, and SageMaker Autopilot is automatically going to inspect the data, uh, prepare the the appropriate feature engineering scripts, um, build some candidate pipelines, launch training jobs, launch tuning jobs to optimize hyperparameters, and you know eventually getting to high accuracy models. So this is a really cool solution. Again, if you use Studio with Autopilot, it's a zero code experience, right? So that's pretty cool. Now, if you need to build uh, your own model and get you know more involved in the process, um, you can select algos from three categories. So on the left, we have the built-in algos. We have 17 algos today. These are off the shelf, uh, already implemented as the Docker containers. So just select the algo that you like and uh, and configure the location of data, configure parameters and train. So you don't need to write actual machine learning code. You will only write a simple Python code to get everything going, but no ML skills are required. You can also use built-in frameworks. So um, 
TensorFlow, Keras, PyTorch, etc. Uh, we have containers for you. They're open source, so you don't need to build and manage and optimize those containers. You can just use ours. And, um, and you just bring your own code. So you bring your PyTorch code or your scikit-learn code uh, with very, very minor modifications to run inside those containers. It's a, it's a nice feature called script mode um, that uh, lets you interface your own code with the container. Super, super simple. And you can literally um, train and deploy anything here. And finally, on the right-hand side, you have everything else. So if you are using R, if you're using C++, if you're using custom Python, anything, uh, you can build your own training container and your own prediction container and following some simple guidelines to uh, uh, integrate them with SageMaker, you can run anything again. So as you can see, you know, lots of options, um, selecting an off-the-shelf model, using O2ML to build one, or getting more involved, uh, selecting the algo yourself, a built-in algo, or bringing your own code, or bringing your own container. Okay, all those things work on SageMaker. Uh, and the common ground here is whatever you use, infrastructure is always fully managed, so you never have to worry about any server. Um, training infrastructure is created on demand, it's terminated automatically, so you will never leave anything on um, and, and doing nothing. And you can use spot instances for training and get typically, you know, 60, 70 percent discount on the training costs. Uh, so, you know, there's really no reason to worry about infrastructure. You can focus on the machine learning problem. Uh, for reference, here's a list of algo. We're not going to read through all of them, but um, the, uh, the orange ones are supervised learning. The yellow ones are unsupervised. So you can see it's a mix of classical uh, machine learning problems like regression, classification, etc. We have some computer vision algos as well um, for classification, detection. Uh, we have algos for natural language processing, anomaly detection, etc. So again, you know, chances are um, your problem is close to one of these. And, um, and again, if I would recommend looking at the built-in algos. They can save you a whole lot of time especially if you don't have machine learning skills, if you're not quite sure um, which algos to try out, just, you know, select the one that solves, say, you know, regression, and, uh, and we have lots of sample notebooks to get you started. So, you know, this is a good place to start if you don't have a lot of machine learning experience. When it comes to frameworks, like I said, um, we have built-in containers for training and prediction, open source, so you can go grab them, build them, run them, customize them, do anything that you want to them and and uh, and understand exactly how they're built, right? Uh, you can also use a feature called local mode where you can train and predict on your local machine. So this is really cool in the early stage of the project when you're experimenting and iterating quickly and you don't want to wait for managed infrastructure to come up and you definitely don't want to pay for managed infrastructure. So you can use local mode and, uh, and just train on your local machine, which could be your local local machine, your laptop, your dev server, or if you're using a notebook instance in SageMaker, it could be local to that notebook instance. But again, you wouldn't be firing up any managed infra and, uh, and you wouldn't be paying for that stuff either. So very cool stuff in the early stage where you only need to experiment with a fraction of the data set. And then you can scale out easily to uh, manage infra. And uh, I mentioned script mode already, which is basically bring your code, add a couple of lines to it, make sure you know you read hyperparameters right, make sure you save the train model in the right place, and that's really that's really all it takes. And uh, and you can run any framework code uh, thanks to script mode, right? Very easy to do. So I quickly mentioned autopilot. So autopilot is again a a more recent capability for O2ML. Just bring your tabular data to S3, uh, select uh, the column you want to predict. So we call that the target, okay? And and that's it. And literally that's it. You can say, tell to autopilot, okay, this is my uh, CSV file in S3. This is the column you need to learn and it will take it from there. Um, 
if you know what kind of problem you're dealing with, you could say, well, okay, build me a, a multi-class classification uh, model. But you could just say, yeah, just figure it out. And that's what I do anyway. And so feature engineering, training, model tuning, all those steps are covered. But it's not, um, it's not uh, opaque, right? You get full visibility and control um, because you get to read and run uh, auto-generated notebooks on uh, on candidates, right? So candidate definitions, training pipelines, tuning pipelines are fully visible inside those notebooks and you can run them yourself and you can understand exactly how data was processed and how the model was built. And uh, and you can keep tweaking if you want, right? So um, it's uh, it's pretty cool. Uh, it's, a, it's a good service. It's very, very easy to, to run. Okay, so once you have a model, I guess if you use autopilot or if you use the marketplace, you're pretty much done at this point. But if you went for a built-in algo or if you went for a built-in framework or your own container, then now now you need to train and tune, right? So let's let's look at that. So the SageMaker API is is reasonably simple. Um, all training and deployment activities are done uh, thanks to a Python SDK, which we call the SageMaker SDK. And um, I call it a high level SDK because the objects you're dealing with are algos and training jobs and deployed deployment jobs, etc. So you don't deal with servers and VPCs and SSH keys or or you know infrastructure objects. So for experimentation, this is really the way to go, and this is the one I'm, I'll be using in the demo. Um, as a side note, there is another SDK for Spark, and that supports uh, Python and Scala. And that I'm not going to be talking about that today, but uh, you can find um, uh, more information on, on GitHub and in our documentation. And in a nutshell, this lets you um, run um, SageMaker jobs directly from your Spark code. And there are many good reasons to do this, namely you know, combine, take the best of Spark for ETL and take the best of SageMaker for training at scale with uh, your own code, etc. And th this is a really powerful combination. So you could also use, of course, any of the language SDKs. Uh, and typically we use Boto3, the, the, Python, the Python SDK for automation and scripting, etc. Um, and of course, you will find SageMaker APIs there. But these are really service level and, you know, sometimes infrastructure level APIs. So I wouldn't recommend them for experimentation because, you know, you, you get full control, but you get some complexity because of that. So the, the SageMaker SDK, the Python SDK is really the one you should be using for everyday work, experimentation, training, etc. And when you need to, to tweak, the, you know, every setting or if you uh, if you want to automate and you need full control and, you know, really 100% of the uh, options, etc., etc., then um, Boto3, for example, is, uh, is interesting. But I'll be using the uh, Python SDK. Uh, SageMaker experiments um, is how you manage those hundreds of thousands of jobs, okay? And then typically, even if you have a simple project, you're going to be pre-processing data, maybe you're going to be using SageMaker processing for that, um, and maybe you're, you're processing different versions of the data sets, and then, uh, of course, you're going to be training quite a few jobs, and you're going to be tuning them, so... Uh, again, lots of different jobs with different hyperparameters, and then you run cross-validation, model evaluation, etc. So even a simple project is going to be you know, potentially hundreds of jobs. So to to make it easier to organize them, search them, compare them, etc., we build SageMaker experiments. So you can organize your projects in uh, in trials, and a trial is going to be a collection of related jobs. And of course, uh, you can log automatically all the metadata associated to those jobs. And then um, using either SageMaker Studio or the Experiments SDK, you can go and explore the information that was logged and uh, and you know find that cool job that you ran three weeks ago and compare experiments, etc., etc., etc. So uh, if, uh, you know, Usually people will build that stuff themselves and uh, and we figured, hey, you know, let's let's make their their life easier. Let's build a capability that lets them organize those jobs. And this is what experiments is. Um, 
so we talked about model tuning a couple of times already and model tuning is really important because it um, helps you find the best hyperparameters automatically right and uh, if you're trying to do this manually you know you kind of waste your time you're never going to hit the the top spot so to speak so um, automatic model tuning is very very easy to use um, you can just define parameter ranges that you want to explore and and then fire up a tuning job and SageMaker will actually use machine learning uh, algorithms to find the best parameters so um, this is a process called Bayesian optimization and Gaussian process regression you don't need to know that uh, and uh, and it will actually use ML to find those parameters to build the best ML models. So it's a bit recursive, but it's very efficient. So it is used, it is part of um, SageMaker Autopilot, as I mentioned before, but you can also run it yourself, right? So you can, uh, once you've built your, let's say your TensorFlow model, and uh, you can launch a tuning job to find the optimal parameters. And again, this is very easy to do, just define ranges, define the metric you want to optimize for, and let SageMaker do its thing. Um, and the last one uh, is, uh, oh, not the last one, almost the last one, um, is SageMaker Debugger. Uh, so SageMaker Debugger is um, a feature that lets you basically understand what's going on inside your model. And, um, and this, is really, this is really important because some of those algos are pretty complicated and uh, and, and people complain, you know, about hmm, models are impossible to explain, et cetera, et cetera. You know, why is my training job going right or wrong? Or why is this model predicting this way? And, you know, am I sure I think it's fine here? Well, it's very difficult to figure that out. So SageMaker Debugger will help you with that. So first of all, it, it's going to um, run debugging rules. Okay, you can configure rules that inspect your training job uh, as it goes okay so you could say for example you know is my loss decreasing um, uh, do I have uh, exploding gradients or vanishing gradients all kinds of weird problems that can happen inside your training job and, and ruin it um, so you don't need to wait for you know three days to see oh wow this is a really bad job so as the training job goes uh, SageMaker Debugger is going to apply those rules to the and inspect the model state and make sure things are okay. If not, it's going to stop the job and say, well, you know, something went wrong. Uh, so we have built-in rules and you can also build your own. And the second thing that it does is um, it lets you save um, model state. So uh, if you're talking about, let's say, a deep learning model, you can save weights and gradients and, and, and basically every tensor that's available inside the model you know metrics and losses etc etc and uh, if you use our built-in containers you don't even need to modify your code you can just bring your existing tensorflow code or uh, pytorch code and say hey please save those tensor collections and they will get saved to s3 and uh, and you can inspect them they get saved on the fly so you can inspect them as the job is running so if you have long running jobs you can already see what's going on and, and you can visualize that data, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So um, debugger is really a way you know, to crack the model open, uh, apply rules to make sure training jobs are going fine, and then inspect all the model state, all the internal state, um, and, and figure out if uh, things are right. And if not, you know, try to understand what went wrong. So once you have a model that you like, it's time to deploy it. And again, we have different options. Um, I guess the most popular option is to use a real-time endpoint. So a real-time endpoint is an HTTPS endpoint backed by fully managed infrastructure and um, that you can invoke uh, HTTP POST data to and get predictions. So this is really one line of code with SageMaker SDK. There's an API called deploy and that's really it. Um, and you can set up auto scaling as well if you want to uh, scale that endpoint according to to traffic. So this is the really the simplest, easiest way, uh, and the endpoint will stay up until you um, explicitly delete it, of course. 
The next option is to use batch transform. So for some customers, uh, real-time prediction is not needed. They maybe they need to predict, you know, 10 gigabyte, um, yeah, gigabytes of data once a week, something like that. Um, so they don't want endpoints. They want batch transform. Just go through that um, batch of data and put results in S3. Okay, and this is again one line of code. It's super easy to do. Um, you could also export the model, like I said, um, you know, just pick what you need. And uh, if you have a company policy that models need to be deployed to container services, then fine. Um, the model is stored in S3. It's a standard model. So if you train with TensorFlow, you have a vanilla TensorFlow model. You can grab it from S3 and deploy it anywhere you like. So it could be, again, a container service, or it could be literally anywhere you like. It could be on your laptop, why not, okay? So, um, and all those combinations work at some point in a project. You know, maybe early on, you want to put the model on your laptop and run your own testing, and, you know, that's fine. And then uh, and then maybe for production, you know, you want real-time endpoints or you want uh, containers. So again, just pick what you need, pick what you like, uh, and build your, your own workflow. SageMaker gives you the, the freedom to do this. Um, the only difference, of course, is if you work with real-time endpoints and batch transform, you're running on fully managed infrastructure, so no worries. One line of code and all infrastructure work is handled. Uh, if you're working with the other solutions, then you have to deal with infra. Uh, and now, the really, the final one I want to mention is <laughs> model monitor. So model monitor uh, is, as the name implies, a monitoring capability for endpoints. So it's going to do two things. It's going to help you capture data sent to the endpoint and predictions returned by the endpoint. So you can set um, a threshold, um, a sampling threshold. You don't need to capture 100%. If you want just 10%, you can do that. And it's going to log to S3 you know, data sent and prediction uh, returned by the endpoint. Okay, so that's useful because you can run analytics or maybe just a simple way to capture real life traffic and replay it on the, uh, during testing, etc. And uh, you can also uh, enable monitoring. So uh, looking for um, violations in data. And what I mean by that is data that is sent to the endpoint and that, that it doesn't look like data that was used for training. So maybe just plain, you know, buggy data where, you know, features are missing or features are mistyped. Um, you know, you're expecting an integer and you're getting a string, something like that. Or, you know, more sneaky problems like uh, data drift where uh, the statistical distribution of a feature is different. And, uh, and of course, this is going to break uh, the training assumptions. And this is really, really hard to detect. Uh, so model monitor is going to do those things. It's going to capture data and it's going to keep an eye out on your data, generating violation reports, alerting you that data that you're receiving now is not quite uh, similar to data that you trained on. Okay, and you can set alerts, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Okay. All right. So uh, well, let's do a demo. Okay. So let me switch to my browser here. And uh, so here I'm using Studio, okay? And uh, if you're curious how to do that, uh, you just go to the SageMaker console and, um, and you need to go to one of the regions where Studio is available. So uh, uh, you can see there are uh, more regions now uh, than originally, so that's good. And just uh, click on Studio. There's a quick start um, uh, process to uh, create your Studio user, etc. It really takes a few minutes. And then you can go and open Studio and you jump straight into um, this, right? Uh, which is running in the browser. So that's pretty cool. And from then on, you know, it's Jupyter as usual, I would say. And uh, and you can launch notebooks and uh, and so on, okay? And there are plenty of features, but let's just, let's just run the notebook now. All right. So this data set is a, a direct marketing data set. Uh, it has about 41,000 samples and it's a binary classification problem where we're trying to predict if a certain customer will accept a marketing offer, yes or no. Okay, so yes or no, two classes, 
binary classification. Okay, so first we grab the data set and maybe let me zoom in a bit. That'll be easier to read. Um, and maybe we can, yes, get this stuff out of the way as well. All right, so we download the data set, extract it, uh, take a look at it. It's a CSV file, but uh, it's not really pleasant to look at CSV. So uh, we can use the pandas library that has a, a nice visualization for CSV. Okay, so just open that CSV file, display the first few lines, and we see features, right? Age, job, marital status, education, etc., etc. And so we have uh, 21 columns and a little more than 41,000 samples, like I said. And um, that last column, uh, which we can't see here, I would have to zoom out. Um, yeah, let's do that. Yeah, here it is. Uh, it's called Y, okay? And this is the label. So this is the column that says, yes or no, did the customer accept the offer? So we have a whole bunch of no's because uh, generally, we have more no's in this data set than we have yeses, but trust me, we have some yeses. Okay, so that's the column we want to learn. So actually, we can count the yeses and the no's, and, and we see the ratio is almost 8 to 1. Okay, so this is an unbalanced data set. It's not severely unbalanced, but it is unbalanced. So this could be a problem. We'll see about that. Okay. So now we need to do some basic transformation. So I will go a little quicker because you know we don't want to focus too much on, on feature engineering here. And of course you'll get uh, uh, you'll get this notebook. The link is uh, on the previous slide. So basically what I'm doing here is uh, you know I'm removing placeholder values and I'm merging some uh, some categories like you know students, retired, unemployed, have in common. Uh, these customers have in common the fact that they don't have a job so I'm creating a new column called not working um, to help the model understand you know there is a relationship um, or there is at least a common attribute between those three columns etc etc and then uh, I have to get rid of all those categorical variables uh, like jobs and um, and you know education etc so I use a technical one hot encoding where I replace um, a single, for example, the, the job column that we have here, right? So that single column is replaced by as many columns as we have different jobs, okay? As you can, uh, as you can see here, job admin, job blue collar, job entrepreneur, etc., etc. So we have one column per job type and we flag to one the actual job for that customer, okay? So that's a technical one hot encoding and that it's heavily used in machine learning to get rid of uh, categorical variables. And we do the same for, you know, marital status and education. So, you know, we increase the number of features, we make the data set harder to understand, but the data set is not for humans to understand, it's for the algo to understand. So now we end up having 66 features, okay? We split the data set for validation and training um, as usual, we save those two splits, uh, or we have three because I have a testing set as well. So those three splits to CSV files, and then we're done with data. And if you didn't like <laughs> this data preparation uh, uh, phase, I hear you. And this is exactly why we are building something like SageMaker Autopilot, because if we were um, if we were using Autopilot here, we would we wouldn't do any of this. We would literally bring the CSV file to S3, call an API, say, hey, we want to predict the Y column, go and build me a model, okay? And that's it, okay? And in the repo that uh, uh, contains this example, there's an autopilot example as well, okay? But of course, I want to show you SageMaker in more detail. So we have to pretend we're really doing machine learning here. Okay, so... Um, so now that we're done preparing the data, we need to upload it to S3, okay? So the training set, the validation set, the test set, put them in an S3 bucket, okay? Um, and so now I have three S3 uh, URIs for those, um, those three files, okay? And now we can get 
to training. So, um, so this is a big chunk because I am actually using a lot of different features here, but don't worry, we're gonna explain all of it. So using the estimator object from the SageMaker SDK, uh, which is the, the generic object uh, for training jobs, I'm going to configure everything here, right? So let's take it one line at a time. Okay, so we create a new estimator and the first parameter is the algorithm we're going to use. And the algorithm we're going to use is XJBoost, one of the built-in algos and you know the go-to algo for a lot of uh, machine learning practitioners for uh, regression and classification and ranking. Okay, so it is available, uh, available as a built-in algo. So I just say, hey, give me the container name for XJBoost in the region I'm running in, and I want uh, XJBoost 1.0, and that's it, okay? So a good example of grabbing an off-the-shelf algo and not worrying at all about uh, coding machine learning uh, in detail. Uh, we need a role, okay? So if you're familiar with AWS, you know what this is. Uh, if you're not, it's basically a collection of permissions that will allow SageMaker to uh, read and write objects in S3, and go and grab the container that we'll just uh, um, got the name for, et cetera, et cetera. So it's all about permissions. And when you're running on, uh, on uh, notebook instances or SageMaker Studio, you can just use the built-in role that was created when you set everything up. So you don't need to worry about it. Uh, the session we can ignore. Um, this is the input data set. Okay, so um, this says really, um, please copy the data set to the training instance. Okay, it's a very tiny data set, so there's no problem copying it. Um, the alternative would be to use a feature called pipe mode where we would stream the data set to the training instance or instances if we were using distributed training. So pipe mode is great when you have really, really large data set. If you have gigabyte or you know gigabytes or tens of gigabytes or more, you don't want to copy that stuff to training instances. You know, it takes too long and it delays the start of your training job. So you can immediately start training by streaming data. Okay, pipe mode, very cool stuff. Uh, output path is where we're going to save the train model. Okay, and these are our infrastructure requirements. Okay, and this is as much infrastructure as you're going to deal with with SageMaker. So if you're uh, a little scared by, you know, again, instances and VPCs and security groups, and, uh, and SSH keys and subnets and all those great <laughs> WS abstractions. Uh, well, fear not because they're all gone, right? Um, unless you go into advanced configurations, um, this is really everything you need. So train on one M4 to Excel instance, which is a CPU instance, okay? That's it. Uh, if we wanted to do distributed training because we had a larger data set, we'd say, hey, give me 10 instances and SageMaker would take care of everything. Okay, so um, trust me, no infrastructure work at all. And the next bit is tr um, spot instances. So spot instances uh, is, uh, uh, is a well-known technique to optimize uh, cost for EC2 instances, and it's also available for SageMaker training. Okay, so um, basically you tap into unused capacity uh, and you get typically 60 to 70% discounts for, for this. And um, the trade-off is that if we need to reclaim that capacity for on-demand instances, then um, we're, you get a two-minute notification and we terminate the instance. Okay, that's how it works on EC2. On SageMaker, things are simple. So we will still reclaim instances if we need to, but SageMaker will automatically restart uh, the training job. So you don't need to handle notifications and, and everything else, right? So if you set up checkpointing, which is a technique where you periodically save the state of the model, then uh, SageMaker will um, restart from the latest checkpoint. And typically, uh, you know, TensorFlow checkpoints automatically and some of the built-in algos checkpoint automatically as well. Uh, XJBoost doesn't. Um, so if you have a checkpoint, we'll restart from the latest one. If you don't have a checkpoint, we just restart the job. Okay. All right. But anyway, we're going to save some money here. 
And finally, we have StageMaker Debugger. So that first chunk uh, is data collection. So we're asking SageMaker to store in S3 the metrics collection of tensors. So we'll see you know, uh, training accuracy, validation accuracy, etc. Uh, we save um, at every step, right? The save interval, right? So again, it's not a lot of data here. So, and it's not a, a complex model, so we can save everything. If you work with deep learning models, you don't really need every single training step. So you could uh, cut down on the amount of data with a, a longer interval, but we are fine here. And we're going to say feature importance, uh, which is a, a cool way of knowing which of your features matter most for prediction. Um, XGBoost also supports uh, shape values if, you, uh, if you're into that stuff. Uh, you can also save uh, the average uh, shape and full shape uh, values, but I'm not doing this here. It's a little more advanced. We'll stick to feature importance. And the second chunk is basically rules. Like I said, we can configure rules to uh, inspect our jobs. And here, we're just going to say, hey, please um, check for class imbalance, right? Remember we said data set is imbalanced about eight to one, which is not really, really bad, but very, very imbalanced data set, uh, you know, one, a hundred to one or a thousand to one are harder to train. So uh, um, it's unlikely we're going to have a problem here, but you know, just to show you how to set up a rule, you can do that. And again, this is a built-in rule. We could bring our own rules. Okay. All right. So all that stuff, and <laughs> it's it's a big uh, it's a big chunk here, uh, is where we configure the algo, configure how data is sent to the training instance, how much uh, infrastructure we want to train on, uh, use spot because we don't want to spend uh, any more than we need to collect those tensors and whoops and apply rules okay so pretty easy okay we have one last thing to do we need to set hyperparameters so um, looking at the documentation we would see the hyperparameters for XGBoost so here we want to build a binary classification model and uh, we want to um, uh, train with the uh, AUC metric, area under curve, which is a good one for classifiers. And we're going to train for 100 rounds. And why 100? I don't know. Uh, which is why I'm, se I'm setting early stopping at 10 rounds. So if that AUC metric stops improving for 10 rounds, then we'll just cut the training short because we don't want to spend any money on a job that's not making any progress. and more importantly, I think we don't want to overfit um, the the algo, right? Okay, and then we just call fit, and we pass that S3 data uh, parameter, which is the location of our data in S3. We set that thing here, right? Okay, the training channel, as we call it, training data set, and the validation channel, and the validation data set. Okay. All right, this is not difficult. And so we see that the training job uh, fires up. It's launching the um, M4 instance that we requested above, right? And we also see uh, the debugging job firing up. So uh, we have one rule, so one job. And if we had more rules, we would see uh, one job per rule, okay? And so these rules, again, are inspecting the model while it's training, okay? So we get everything ready. We download the input data to the instances, and you can see this really takes you know two minutes, right? And uh, and then we fire up training, okay? And um, so we download the container image, that XJBoost container, to the to the instance, and we start training, okay? And then we see the training log in the notebook. It's also available in uh, CloudWatch logs, okay? We see metrics improving, blah blah blah. Uh, we train for a total of 57 seconds, but we only pay for 12 because spot instances. And wow, this is pretty good. We saved 78.9% by using spot, right? So if you have short jobs, which are extremely unlikely to be interrupted, using spot training is pretty much mandatory, right? They look at those costs. Very cool. As we configured uh, SageMaker Debugger, we also saved 
tensors, right? So we can ask for the S3 location of those tensors. And okay, this is utility code for plotting. So let's not worry too much about that. We can grab collections and we can grab tensors inside a collection. Okay, and basically we can plot that stuff and say, hey, please plot me the um, the metrics collection. And this uh, collection has two tensors, so the training AUC and the validation AUC, and we can plot it with a matplotlib, right? So as you can see very easily, you can grab any data that was saved by SageMaker Debugger and, and plot it. And uh, this is feature importance. Okay, so here we're plotting the weight. So we see uh, the feature numbers. Okay, and this is the order in which they appear in the data set. So we can see the most important one is feature one. And the second next is feature five. And so one and five, I actually wrote it down here. Uh, one and five are job and housing. So which kind of makes sense, right? If you have a good job and if you have a, you know, if you're housed, uh, if you have a nice house, then yeah, probably, you, you know, you're well off and, uh, and you're more likely to accept a marketing offer. Okay, so as you can see, this is super easy. Just save that data and go and plot it. Uh, we can deploy it very easily. We just call the deploy API, right? Uh, we just say, hey, deploy this to one M4 Excel instance, and we capture some data, okay, using SageMaker Debugger. So we're going to capture 100%, uh, all requests, all responses, and we're going to store that stuff to a three, okay? So we wait for the endpoint to come up. Okay, and uh, we probably see here, here. Yeah, we can see that endpoint is running here. Okay, and um, and then we can predict. So we just call the uh, invoke endpoint API, and we send some CSV data, and we get some predictions. So it's a binary classification model. So we get predictions between zero and one, and we could say all predictions lower than 0.5 or a no, higher than 0.5 or a yes. Okay, it would be for us to decide where that threshold is depending on how many false positives or false negatives we can live with, okay? And if we look at the capture path, then we see files, which are JSON line files, showing um, data that was sent to the endpoint or uh, predictions that were output by the endpoint. And we exactly see that, right? We can see um, here, a sample being sent, and we can see its prediction, right? So we could also set, like I said, uh, violation reports, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It's not difficult to do. You can see that stuff in in the sample notebooks. But um, for the sake of time, of uh, in the interest of time, uh, you know, I can't show you everything, unfortunately, today. And batch prediction is just as easy as calling transform and um, passing the location of the data in S3, and so you fire up. A managed transformer it's going to crunch through your data and it's going to save predictions to s3 and then you can copy those results from s3 and uh, and view results and when you're done you can just delete the endpoint right so this is basically what uh you know first uh run through SageMaker with the main features there are many more uh, but as you can see um, it's a, it's a really simple sdk and you never worry about infrastructure and you just focus on building a model and you know tweaking a model and understanding what's going on etc cetera, etc cetera. and uh, you know if you have no machine learning experience you can get the job done and if you do have machine learning experience then you can you can basically save a ton of time by uh, by using SageMaker features and fo focusing on on the problem at hand okay all right so where do you get started Okay, so um, it's worth looking at this first URL, which is called the free tier. Uh, you can use SageMaker for completely for free under certain conditions. Uh, so make sure you are within those conditions, and uh, you can uh, you can learn about SageMaker for really you know uh, zero uh, zero cents. If you want to know more about our machine learning services in general, I would recommend that you visit ml.aws, which is where. Uh, you'll find all the services and customer stories, etc. The next one is, of course, the SageMaker page with a focus on uh, SageMaker features and customer um, stories and use cases, etc. This is the Python SDK on GitHub, uh, the one that I used. This is the Spark SDK, which I quickly mentioned. 
And this is a really important resource. It's the collection of SageMaker examples on GitHub. And we have hundreds of notebooks showing you the built-in algos, the built-in frameworks, and in literally every configuration. So please make sure you go and, and look at this. To me, this is really the best way to understand how SageMaker works. And uh, if you want some of my own resources, you can find some of my notebooks on, uh, on GitLab as well. And I have plenty of SageMaker and, and machine learning videos on YouTube, as well as at my uh, podcast. If, you, uh, if you're interested, take a look. Uh, lots of fun there. And finally, I'm also blogging on Medium, and, uh, and you may like that too. Well, I think that's the end of the presentation. I hope this was useful. I hope you learned a few things, and I hope you want to try SageMaker. And uh, please feel free to get in touch. Uh, you know, LinkedIn, Twitter, etc. I'm pretty easy to find. If you have questions, if you have feedback, I'd be more than happy to uh, to help you out. Thanks again, and uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Bye bye.